Jason, let's um, let's jump in on the quarterly letter. A um, lot of volatility. Uh, the worst bond year in the last three or four hundred years. Which one is it? <laughs> Depending on if you you believe Bank of America or Deutsche Bank, we'll just split the difference and say three hundred fifty years. But it's suffice to say, it's certainly the uh, the, the worst bond record that anybody um, you know has ever experienced that's in the market. And I think, um, and we're going to talk about this uh, as we go along, but. That was the really big surprise yes. of 2022. Yes, bonds off, uh, they closed the year off 13. At one point they were off as much as 17%. I think that's been my dialogue with clients when we're recapping 2022. Look, the stock market has always been volatile and there's probably a second conversation. Look, if, if you were not comfortable with the S&P 500 closing off 18 or 19, probably a bigger picture conversation because that's gonna happen every five to 10 years if not more often, who knows? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, before this era of, I think, less volatility, easier yep. money, I mean, you would have 10% declines happen two or three times a year. I mean, that was just kind of a normal, you know, a normal occurrence. And I think as, uh, you know, the Fed, uh, the US Federal Reserve and global central banks in general got a little bit more active in yep. markets, maybe took their price stability uh, mandates a little bit too far past the original kind of inflation, uh, mandate. I, I think investors just got really comfortable. Oh, when the market goes down, I'm going to buy. So in a buy year like yep. buy the dip, like in a year like 2021, I think that there was, I don't know. I think that maybe the, 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 the drawdown was like three yeah. or four percent. I mean, there Correct. was yeah, that was the largest drawdown we had in 2021. Uh, I think people can get really complacent and or at least maybe not complacent so much as I think that they believe that the Fed was always going to be there for them and that if the volatility spiked, the Fed would come in and backstop it, cut rates, announce a new buyback, a new mortgage, you know, a new mortgage buying program. Well, look, we've been at this long enough. You can go back and read the tape. I think at one point in one of the quarterly videos from 2021, we would have said, this is not the normal year. This is not the normal where you have yeah. limited drawdowns and, you know, oh, we're off 2% and you're like, oh, that's a big drawdown. That, that wasn't the normal. I'm not saying that 2022 was the normal, but You've already went where I was going to go next. So now let's explain the why to 2022. Always obvious now that we get to look back, right? It, it wasn't obvious in June of last year that we're about to see rate hikes like we haven't seen since uh, Jimmy Carter was president. Yeah, right? I, I think you said that you, you said it with coming into 2022, the consensus among economists and the U.S. Federal Reserve was they were going to have one Right, 25 to 50 basis point variety, increase. Garden variety, variety hey, we're going to get off of zero. Right, and, right. And what happened was inflation was most certainly not transitory. And that was always going to be the case. And then just like in every year where you don't know what's going to happen. So you had inflation wasn't going to be transitory. They were always as that truth got revealed to them. I think it's a truth that a lot of us felt because we'd go to the grocery store. We're right. put, you know, we're putting gas yep. in our car. All of these things we could feel, uh, you know, services were, you know, it was just more expensive to go out to eat. That was always going to cause the Fed to, to to be data dependent and they were going to raise rates. And then you throw on the unlikely events of Russia invading the Ukraine. Uh, Putting pressure on energy markets, specifically in Europe. Exactly. And then that, that was unexpected. And then just the trajectory of in inflation. There's There are misses where you're wrong. Like, hey, I think the score of the game is going to be 20 to 17 and it's 23 to 17. Okay. You know, you were right. The team won. Well, but in Vegas, that would be a big miss. In, yes. ba in Vegas, yep. in, anywhere else other than Vegas, not a big miss, right? But this was like, man, the score of the game was 45 to 17. And the team that scored 45 was the team that we thought was going to score 17. The Georgia TCU title game, if you want to play in real time. I was going to leave, you know. Ohio State out of it? Yeah. That's fine. So that, I, was, I wasn't going to go there. Yep. Uh, but yeah, exactly. That's that's essentially what happened with inflation. It just ran, they ran away with it. And inflation got so high that it, it clipped a 9% year over year handle in June. And now, now you have a Fed trying to play catch up. And so instead of that 125 to 50 basis point increase, they had they, they, they increased it by 25 and then by 50 and 50. Then they had four straight 75 basis point increases in a row. It was the, the rate of tightening. And by tightening, we mean uh, the Federal Reserve raising interest rates. That rate of tightening the pace, the, the pace, pace of it, which they went the pace out. of yes. the tightening yeah. was the 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 steepest, most quick, the, the quickest uh, tightening regime since Paul Volcker. 
1980, 1981. By the way, that was in a six month. It wasn't like we're talking about all no. of 2022. This stuff, this stuff doesn't start kicking in until halfway through last year. And, and then all of a sudden we're going at a rate we haven't seen in 40 years. Yeah, correct. And, and I think <clears> that what, what, what took investors by surprise, and we write about this in the, in the letter, bond math, generally speaking, for the most part, works the same way on the way up as it does on the way down. For those that haven't heard me use this analogy, it's like a seesaw. As prices go up, yields go down. And for 40 years, we had that scenario where prices just kept going up and yields kept going down because the yield on the 10-year treasury in the early 1980s was around 15, 16%. So you had this long runway. 40-year bull market and bonds. 40-year bull market and bonds powered by <clears throat> declining interest rates and inflation. Inflation and interest rates were on parallel trajectories for the better part of the last 40 years. And that created this very large bull, bond bull market, which was great, right up until the point that it wasn't. And the interest rate hikes affected the bond market more swiftly than in the equity market. There are a lot more factors that go into right. equities uh, in, the, in the stock prices. What are you selling? Where are you selling it? What is your capital structure? How sensitive are you to economic growth? Those are things that get sorted out over several quarters or years in years even. Whereas the, the bonds re-rated overnight. Imme overnight, overnight, immediately. I mean, it's, I mean we just talked about it, right? The it, volatility you saw in bonds, you hadn't seen in three or 400 years. And, 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 in that, and, and, and the thing that was so surprising was that high quality bonds, whether it's municipal or, or taxable like treasuries and agencies, those are the traditional ballast to your portfolio. When, when equities do decline by that yep. 15, 20%, <clears throat> the bonds are supposed to be there for you. In 2008, when publicly traded real estate was down 60% and international equities were down 40 and US equities were down 45. Barclays aggregate was up 5%. Right. It was there. That's historically how this has played That's out. Just, yeah, exactly. So let's go to maybe the final piece that you lay out in the quarterly letter. And I, I won't steal your thunder, but you, you allude to a new normal. So maybe roll out your phrase. Or the new normal started in a year where there was no place to hide. And when we looked at the, the composition of capital markets and how they performed, whether it was traditional markets like US, you know, US large cap stocks, S&P down 18, small cap stocks, Russell 2000 down 20, the, the international outside of the US, the Acqui X US, which is just can, any, any equity that's publicly traded that's not US based, down 16%. Publicly traded real estate down 26. High yield bonds down 11. Barclays aggregate, which is treasuries and agencies down 13. Immunity's down eight and a half percent. Fair to say there was nowhere to hide because of the pressure that we saw from interest rates going up. That if it, it was a risk asset of any nature, it was going to take a haircut. It's just how much. It, exactly right. And and I think in when when it took place, right? And there were there were rallies that that happened, but I think that for the most part, you know, there were some there were some segments and sectors like energy that ended up rallying. But sure. even in even in commodities, commodities <clears throat> were negative in the second, third, and fourth quarter. All their price appreciation happened in the first quarter. Yep. Um, and, and so I, you, you look at that and, and even the one asset class that was up, you know, when you're looking at it, it, you know, it, it's, it wasn't a, a place where you could even, you know, find even short, short treasuries were down right. you know, a couple percent because right. of the effect of the, the effect of the interest rates. So it, I, I think what, when you look back on what happened and then, in, and then in the fourth quarter, what you started to observe like new leadership happening. Okay, well, what, what does it mean when uh, inflation has peaked in the US, we're still in this tightening phase, what is economic growth gonna look like in 23, 24, and 25? And I think the what is going to work in 23 and 24 and 25 is gonna be you know, different than what worked for the last you know, five years, That's 10 years. That's where I was gonna go. You hint at in the letter, a regime change, right? So the trade for the last decade, for more or less has been mega cap US, heavy technology, yes. phenomenal operating leverage, asset light models that keep growing earnings. You're implying, are we at a, a regime change or look, you can't just keep following that same playbook. And you make some quotes and references to that in yeah, the letter. I, I think, and it's not that I think that, you know, US <laughs> large cap or mega cap, we still believe are going to be negative. Right? Yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not throwing that out. But, but right. I, what, I, what I would say that is that there are parts of the market that re-rated lower, right? That took this interest rate hike and took this slower economic growth outlook and re-rated lower, right? They, they, the prices contracted domestically, small and medium-sized publicly traded companies. 
yep. international markets. You, you know, obviously the war in the Ukraine puts you know energy strain. You know, the United Kingdom still dealing with knock-on effects from Brexit and what that exactly means. And then in emerging markets, coming into 2022, this was going to be the end of this was going to be the, the end of the second term of, of Xi Jinping, who's the premier of China, and he decided that he wanted to stick around. And he, and he ushered out. He not the, only wants to stick around, I think he wants a permanent appointment. I, I think right? he wants the permanent job. And and what happened was he physically had, had Hu Jintao, who was you know, removed the former, from the meeting. Removed. Yep. You know, you know, thank you for coming. Like literally, and physically. Physically yes. removed out. And, and I think that that plays a different dynamic on China and Taiwan. Those two large economies have played such a, a part in, in emerging Asia and just the broader economic context. So there, there were just a lot of things that happened and those markets all re-rated lower, EM, international, small and mid, whereas you still had US large caps are still trading at a premium to they were at history. And these really good companies like Google and Microsoft and Apple and Amazon who like they do wonderful things. But there's a difference. There's the yeah. company and there's, there's, there's the stock. stock price. You can love the company, but the stock, if it gets bit up too far, becomes and, a stock you don't want to own. And it doesn't mean that those, that those stocks even have to dramatically drop. Right. It could just be that the, the, assets or these risk assets that, that declined in value are going to come up right mm -hmm. so i think that there's a lot more upside and a lot of it has to do with the strength of the us dollar and really since the bottoming of the great financial crisis the dollar has been on a, a fairly you know it, it hasn't been a perfectly line up into the right sure. but a fairly strong upward trend and right around the time that inflation peaked you started to see the, the signs of the dollar rolling over and it rolled over in the fourth quarter and it declined when you look at the dollar index which is the dollar against a basket of other currencies. Okay, well, what did well? So if you just, if you deconstruct it, it starts to benefit US and, and smaller companies, right? right? Because small and medium sized companies, for the most part, they're selling to me and to, and to you. It, they might get their inputs for their widgets someplace else, but they're predominantly facing they're, the US economy. Their consumer, their end product but is when you're, yep. when you're you, When you're a large cap US stock and 50% of your revenue comes from outside the US, the strong dollar, goes further when you're trying to make fixed investments and, and do those things. So that works really well. It's a tailwind. Well, the, the inverse is also true. When the dollar starts to weaken, it's less of a tailwind, it becomes a little bit more of a headwind for these large multinationals. And it's a tailwind for international stocks, emerging market stocks, and small and medium-sized companies. And if you just looked at the S&P 100, which is the 100 largest yep. publicly traded stocks. The megas. Mega caps. It was up a little <laughs> bit over 5% in the fourth quarter. Mid caps were up 10 Small caps were up nine. International stocks as a broad group, developed and emerging, were up 14.7%. Now, it, it's it's obviously it's a window, right? It's, it's a, a quarter, it's, it's a, a three-month period of time. But, right. but, I, but as we as we started to come into to the new year, these trends are still holding. And it, it it is a, you know, markets are mean reverting. And I think that there's the the new normal that we see is volatility is going to continue to go up. Right? We're going to have more of it, not less, as we grapple with all the, the, the knock-on effects of inflation. You're getting you're getting paid to own fixed income. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is like a viable you alternative. You haven't gotten paid to own fixed income in a decade, if we to, look at yes. past rates. Yeah, yes. and so now you're getting paid to own fixed income, so savers don't have to go out there and, and, and make more risky decisions. That's a, that's a viable alternative. And, and what you can't just count on being long and strong, the S&P right. 500, right. to solve all your problems because mm -hmm. There is there are a lot of dynamics. There are a lot of things that were tailwinds for the S and P 500 that might create somewhat of a headwind relative to some of these these underperforming asset classes. And we believe in diversification. We've held them when they've under they've underperformed. We've been obviously the single largest exposure that we have is to U.S. large cap equities. However, with that being said, where are we putting new money? We're not going to be putting new money at U.S. large cap stocks. It's going to go into the areas where we're actually seeing value, whether it's in fixed income for the first time in a decade plus, or in small and medium sized companies domestically and international right. uh, companies that we think offer a really good value. So in the new normal, when I hear you say all that, diversification still, still is our thought process, right? I mean, we're not so confident as to say we're gonna slide all the chips into large cap value and international, right? No, I, mean, I, I think you need to have diversification, but in terms of the next dollar in, I think right. you need to be more discerning about where you put it in. And, and investors are already becoming discerning. If you can make 4% in a money market fund or 4% in a treasury, you know, great. Go clip you, some coupons. You might, might go clip some right. coupons and wait and wait to see what's on the other side. So I, I think as uh, if you're gonna, if, 
you're you're a stock, you're, you know, you're a company that wants you know people to invest. Well, if the if the risk free rate is now you know the ten year treasury is at three and a half percent and the short term treasury is at four, you're going to have to offer them you know a, a, a very compelling investment opportunity. My hurdle rate has gone your hurdle up. rate goes yep. up, yep. and as investors become more discerning, valuations kind of come come back in even further, and that creates the longer term investments because we you know I. I think the only time that we could be considered in a bubble and what I consider a bubble to be is what Cliff Asnes, who's the co-founder of AQR, says is that when you expect on a 10 year period that bonds are going to outperform stocks, that's kind of you're in a bubble. I don't think we're there. I don't think, right. I don't right. think bonds are going to outperform stocks. With all that being said, over the next 10, over the years, next 10 years, you could have a period right. where they you do. Could, you could have a period where they do, but still, we believe in the long run, stocks are going to be the way that you're going to you're going to um, you're going to have growth. You're going to grow your portfolio over time. Fixed income is just going to have a more of a traditional role where it serves as the ballast and yep. you're being able to generate income, which I think is exciting for our clients that are more conservative that probably had to own more equities yep. than they otherwise would have liked just because they're quite frankly priced out of the market in the, on the fixed income side. So maybe let's close for the, the audience. Um, look, we appreciate that 2022 was not an easy year to be an investor, right? You had unprecedented bond volatility in combination with the stock market. So maybe some closing thoughts for the audience on 2022. And generally speaking, our expectation that investors, disciplined investors that keep their head in periods of like 2022 historically get rewarded. And we don't think that trend is broken. No, I don't. And I think this is where it's really important to get kind of to the blocking and tackling and the fundamentals of, of investing. Bonds were down double digits and that, that that's never fun, but they still held up better than stocks. There's rebalancing opportunities to be had where you're selling something that held up better. And we have you know, some real asset. Well, if you go we, look in the strategic income, we have some strategic income yep. where we, we have some positive performance where you can you can sell. Right. You're going to rebalance and do do some of the things that maybe you weren't as uh, likely to do, given the stocks you know continue to, yep. to be on this run. Now you can get back to a more standard, you know, standard asset allocation. Where you're rebalancing in and you're selling maybe you're selling some fixed income maybe you're selling some strategic income and moving it into these places and topping up areas that relative to the s p still did you know you know still and in the interim market. your bonds you know if we just use today three and a half four percent doesn't seem like an unrealistic outlook for for yeah. bonds no and, and i think that that's 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 important especially for our clients that are more conservative right. and maybe are are have retired or are about to retire you, know, you don't really have to worry like my i always think back to this is like my aunt margie who used to work for um, you know, for Ohio Bell that got bought by AT and T, she took a lump sum. Uh, you know, she graduated you know high school and you know, didn't really understand investing. So owning AT and T stock was this very foreign thing to her, and so she sold it the minute that she could. And she just would flip CDs and she would look, open up the. Right. I think everybody that remembers opening up the, you know, had a grandparent that would yep. open up, you know, the paper and they she'd look at the CDs and flip them. Well, you haven't been able to make any money flipping CDs and you know, kind of rolling CDs, and now. You know, for for savers, you know, that's it's a much more viable option. And for our conservative, for our more conservative clients, you can kind of get back to their comfort levels, right? And so I think that there's we, there's a lot to learn from 2022. And the way that I end the letter is just saying that what we can't do now that we're out of this is is spend you know the next three, six, nine, twelve months trying to fight the last war. And there's a quote from. Lieutenant Colonel J.L. Shelley, who was in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who had a quote in 1929, who I always attributed to Churchill because Churchill had said it, uh, but it was actually this this Lieutenant Colonel, and he, you know, said that in, in peacetime, uh, generals get together and and try and uh, figure out how to fight the last war. And I think what we're trying to do on the investment side and on the and on the advisor side of our of our group is really to be, you know, come into 2023 eyes wide open. Right. What we think is going to be a new a new normal of investing where it's not just going to be one dominant asset class, you know, U.S. large cap equities that are going to be driving returns. The reason why diversification is going to be so important is that you're going to be getting contributions, uh, you know, contributions from small, right. medium, fixed right. income, places, international. international places where, you know, maybe had less of a contribution uh, in years past. I think that was well said. We wish everybody a happy new year and, uh, we will be in touch and don't be don't hesitate to reach out to us as well if you'd like to have a conversation.